We're only in quite a small space here, but the mapping technology will cover much, much larger areas. We can do whole buildings, we can do mine systems, all sorts of things. So we're We the Curious in Bristol, it's a big science museum. This is a map we built using the robot. We navigated the robot around using the same mapping device. We can then build up the whole map of this whole area. And if we wanted to, we could then send the robot out autonomously to wander around in, in this space. The risk assessment says that really we can only operate in a controlled space. So here you can see we've got some barriers. We've got, we've got David here who's helping us control the space. Um, so that means that people who come into the space know what they're doing. Uh, in general, we should be two meters away from the robot when the motors are engaged. That means we can't just send it out autonomously into this space. It would be able to navigate around people safely, just as it can around other obstacles. The robot is quite powerful. So if people weren't paying attention, it would also be a risky interaction. So yeah, we can't just send it out. We've done stuff in the past. We've got other robots, mobile robots that are safety rated. They have big rubber bumpers. You just don't do it with Spot. Well, not yet anyway, one day maybe. So we've got a Boston Dynamics Spot robot. And the interesting thing for us is the payload on top. So if you see a Spot without any payload on there, then you know people are not doing too much autonomous with it. The stuff on top is what we use to make it autonomous. On the front, we've got what we call a frontier device. So this is a kind of integrated unit. On the top, you've got a LiDAR that's giving you laser measurements, sort of 360 degrees around the, the robot in kind of a cone. So you're always seeing a kind of a range of measurements around there. On the front, we've got a, a real sense, Intel RealSense camera that is used to track the motion of the robot frame by frame using the images. It's also got an inertial measurement unit in there, IMU, so we can track a little bit of how the device moves. And this box is an Intel NUC. What does NUC stand for? Is it a, is it's it a... next unit of computation. So it's an Intel design of kind of a small motherboard, kind of small form factor PC. So all the computation, all the algorithms we're using to build 3D maps, to plan robot missions, it's all running inside that box. And we've got effectively an ethernet cable and a power cable. That's all that's, that's running out of the robot. Over here, we've got a mesh Wi-Fi network. So when we go autonomy and we want to go beyond line of sight, we can drop a breadcrumb trail of Wi-Fi repeaters that we're able to use from that. What we're doing with the robot and the whole payload is looking at autonomous inspection missions. So the aim is to take a robot like this map a facility and then have the robot autonomously repeat a mission where that mission might be to take some images of different locations to measure, for example, radiation. We've been working part of a radiation project or do gas detection. So anywhere you want a robot to monitor a large scale facility, we put these things together to achieve that kind of, those kind of missions. On the screen here, we've got the visualization uh, of the, the software the robot's running. Um, so as I said, what we want to do is build a, a large map of the, of the area and we're gonna perform autonomous inspection in that. So if you're in a site, you typically need two things to uh, be able to, to do that. You need the 3D representation of the environment, and you also need a, a mission planning system to be able to task the robot. So our kind of standard tasks are, go there, do that. Go to the fire door, check whether it's open or closed, for example. So you can see these two things on the screen. These white dots are the, the returns from the laser or the LiDAR. That's showing us what the robot can see, but that's also kind of the, the starting point of the 3D map. We only just turned the robot on, so it's quite sparse. And that's gonna get denser and denser as the robot walks around and gets more points. Then you've got this graph here. That's gonna be our mission system. So when I say go there, do that, the there is gonna be one of these nodes. So it's a location the robot can go to. So what we're gonna demonstrate is we can build both of these representations at once online. And we're gonna do that by actually giving the robot missions. And the mission will be to go just walk to a location. So my awesome assistant, Michal here, is going to send the robot to a, a node. It's gonna select it on the interface and then the robot will walk off to that location. As it's doing that, it's checking the space around it. And in that space, what it's doing is it's looking for extra areas where it can add the nodes to build that graph up. It's also continually building the, the 3D representation around it. So if you look back at the screen, you can see that it's denser here now than it was before. So more points, we've got more graph, and the robot is just gradually walking around, building up the representation. So at the moment, the movement across the graph is autonomous, but the, the, the locations the robot's going to, we're picking those manually. So we could do this fully autonomously, we could just let the robot loose and it would continually build up a map, or you could even do it fully manual, so you could pick up a joystick and drive the robot around. So this is now, the, the mapping stage as complete as we need it to be. In a space like this, we can't go very far, so the robot's done. And then we can switch from the, this sort of exploration mode, we can switch into missions. So what we'll do now is Michal can switch the system into a mode where instead of us just driving it around, we can just give it a list of tasks. 
So the task will be to go to particular locations and perform inspections. Um, and usually we'd have some kind of inspection payload. Uh, so we're working with a company called Createch as part of a, a, a large scale collaboration around nuclear robotics. And so we might carry a gamma sensor to measure radioactivity at particular locations. We've also done visual inspections of oil and gas facilities. This is the kind of complete map. This is about as, as good as we're gonna get given this small area. I haven't had much space to move around in, so. <laughs> so that's a here. point cloud that, yeah. that yeah. the LiDAR's given you. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we can see various bits outside the glass as well, but most of it's kind of constrained yes, inside Yes, because the there's glass walls. Room. Yeah, yeah, you got you. And what we're doing is when we're querying the space, we're not using this representation. It's quite hard to query. So when I say query, we're saying, is there a bunch of space where I could put a node? So instead of querying the point cloud, we put this in something called an Octomap, which is a kind of a voxel-based representation. So it's like pixels, but in 3D. And they're a lot coarser, and you can use those to quickly look up how much space is occupied, how much free space is there. So that allows us to do faster queries than you would, you would on the, the point cloud. In fact, this is it. Thanks. So this is kind of Lego Minecraft uh, of this room. Right? Yeah, this is, this is the Minecraft version so of the world. These are on the order of 10 centimeter cubes. And we use those to basically ray trace through the environment. And we have a small bounding box around the ray so that we can actually capture you know, if there's a small hole in the environment, we don't want to poke through that hole. We want to make sure that we capture all of the kind of environmental hazards, as it were, in the, in the projections that we're doing so that we don't place nodes in places where uh, we wouldn't want to go with the robot. If you know exactly where you want the robot to go, you take the 3D map and then you manually annotate it with the points. In this case, we're doing it entirely, well, in a, the, the graph is built autonomously using that, that, that Lego representation. So you say, are there any Lego bricks in this area? If not, then I'll pop a node in there because I can move there. And, and you've configured how big the robot is and therefore whether it'll fit. Yeah. So all I have to do is basically I'm selecting a, a node in the interface. And when I click it, stuff happens in the system in the background, basically looking up the closest nodes to this point. And then we compute, I think, what was the Floyd Warshall, so we're doing yeah, shortest path through the graph to reach the target location. And what you'll see is basically the yellow arrows are showing the policy that we're using to traverse the graph, which is if I'm at this node, what path would I need to take to get to the goal location? And this applies to every single node in the whole graph. So I'll send it to node, I think that's node eight, and you'll see that the arrows in the graph will change to all point towards node eight. Well, the policy gives the robot action for every location in its world because we often do this in dynamic environments or with uncertainty. So that means the robot, even though it's trying to get to one location, it might accidentally end up at another location. If it avoids an obstacle that it doesn't know is there, then it needs to know what action to perform when it reaches that state. So that's why in, in the visualization, you'll see actions from all the locations, not just the shortest path. This is kind of the manual autonomy stage, as it were. So I've been selecting the points that we're going to to build up the, um, the map that we're using for localization. Um, but as Nick said, we have kind of the second stage, which is the, auto the full autonomy stage, where we specify actions at specific nodes, and we can then perform visual inspections or whatever else we can do. Right here, we don't actually have an inspection payload, so basically what we have to do is use some kind of body motions to indicate, right, when we're here, we would do something. What you'll see is the robot will be moving its body when it reaches a particular location. The reason we move the body is because when you're doing an inspection, typically the sensors are mounted on the front or the back of the robot. And you need to position the robot's body relative to the target. So these are all um, actions you'd, we would use in practice. Sometimes you want to look high, you want to look low, you want to look around a corner. So you'll see all of those kind of actions deployed by the robot. All right, I'm going to start a mission in a second. I've entered some relevant names into our text file which we then pause and basically send the mission. This is definitely not a user interface. This is a development tool. We've built it in fact. What is, what is the development environment then? This is just a Vim editor that I'm using to edit things. I'm connected through this Wi-Fi extender to the robot. So I'm, I'm using Vim because that's the easiest thing that I know to use. But I'm using, I'm using Emacs key bindings and PyCharm, so. I mean, we could also talk a little bit about the, the various software tools we're using. Okay, well, should we do that after we watch the mission? Yeah. Then? I've specified a couple of nodes which are reasonably separated within our environment and it's reached the final, the first node. So now we'll just do a little body roll. Orienting its cameras better to get a better image of the target. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or looking quizzically at the door, that's also a... 
and then it will reroute to the next node in its mission. So I, after I send the mission, I'm not touching anything at all. It's, uh, it's doing everything fully autonomously. It's really worth reinforcing that. This is all on board the robot. Everything is running on board the robot. We are not giving it any commands. We've just specified where it should go and what it should do there. It's using the graph that was built up earlier. So it's got its map of the world, so it knows where it's safe to move. It's got its, gra its topological graph, the network was on the floor, that tells it where it should be moving through the space. All this autonomous behavior is enabled by the t payload on the top. So we talked through earlier, the LiDAR at the front, we've got various Wi-Fi connections running off it. And that's what, you know, if you see a, a spot in a video or a show where there's nothing on top, they're typically, people who are using it are typically not doing anything autonomous. You need that payload on top either to, to, to enable the capabilities here or to do something when you're autonomous. So it shows you what you're doing with the platform. And why wouldn't you just cover an area with sort of CCTV cameras or something? Why use a robot like this? Oh, that's a good question. So for some applications, fixed sensing is better. If, if the world is static, the sensors are cheap. I think robots often occupy this sweet spot where you've got a reasonably expensive sensing payload and you need to get it into places where you can't continually monitor. So for us, uh, large facilities where you want to just image certain areas, but you can't get humans in there. Um, places where you want to see round corners, um, all sorts of places where you put the robots in. Um, I think the other thing we're looking at is, is really the long-term angle. So what we'd like to do next is have a, a robot-like spot that lives in a facility, and it has a sort of daily routine, a to-do list. It gets up in the morning, it walks around and checks the same things, does the same inspection tasks or intervention tasks at certain locations. And then because you're using a robot, you get very repeatable data, very repeatable observations uh, from those sensors you're using there. People often feel they're being observed. If you've got cameras everywhere, people behave differently. If a robot walks up and the robot, you know the robot is the thing carrying the camera, it's kind of, it shows you that this is the thing doing the inspection. You're not being monitored constantly. You've just got this robot that's doing the observations. The vast majority of the code that we have running is running using the ROS middleware system. So it's basically a message passing system which allows us to uh, communicate over multiple computers. So my computer is connected to a ROS core, which is basically the system that is kind of running the whole robot that's living on the NUC that we have inside the payload. And basically we use a, a subscriber publisher thing. So we're sending messages regularly to, to specific topics and we're using that information on other nodes which live in the system, separate to map nodes, there are ROS nodes which run components of the system. Maybe a good example is the LiDAR. There's a driver that's reading the data off the LiDAR. That data is then being published into the ROS system. In fact, we could, we could see it on the screen. So what you're getting is that the, the data is being, being turned into a data type. It's being published on the network. You can subscribe to it on the robot to do some processing on board, or I mean, when we run the visualizations, that's what we're doing. We're subscribing to the data streams that are coming off the robot, and then you can use them on the computer to measure things. You can also visualize them. So the whole system is based on this topic infrastructure, and that allows you to do things kind of quickly, add new components, reuse things. And the other advantage of a component-based middleware is you can write components in different languages. ROS stands for the Robot Operating System, and it's that operating system element, which means translating between languages and allowing multiple components to run. So a lot of the mission planning side that we've written is written in Python. A lot of the mapping side is written in C++, but we use ROS to make sure that these things can talk to each other uh, kind of as the robot's running. It's like the robot Slack, is it? Yeah, absolutely. You've got a chat. So no, it's, exa it is exactly like Slack. Well, not exactly like Slack. That's, that's a complete exaggeration. It's similar, so you've got channels, the channels are topics. The topics have a name which describes the purpose. So you might have front, front left camera would be the, the topic, and then it just has a data type. In this case, it would be an image data type. And if you, if you want to get messages about the front left camera, you join that channel. Uh, no, it's a, yeah, it's a great analogy. Then you can see that the depth still works, but it's much, much worse than it was before. And that's because now we only have the two cameras. We're just doing the best we can with what we've got. So areas robotics. like you... So this you idea of probabilistic robotics has been the dominant approach to program robots at the moment.